If you are new on YouTube or thinking about growing a channel, today's a perfect episode for you. I'm gonna run you through the way I plan all the content for my channel, how I shoot it, how I edit it, how I upload it, and what I do after it's uploaded to help grow my channel, so stay tuned. Hey everybody, it's Nick from One Guitar, so welcome back. Today I'm gonna to talk to you about the whole way that I actually make this channel. The majority of the time you see me, I'm actually playing guitar, I'm doing something, but I'm gonna talk about how I get to that point and all the behind the scenes things. First of all, let's go through planning. I plan things a lot of different ways. When I first came up with the channel, I wanted to do it a guitar-based kind of thing, but I ended up uh, putting a lot of camera gear in there because I like that stuff and it actually helps make the channel. I can't do it without all this camera gear. So that was part of it too, and I do like the camera gear, so I started reviewing those. In addition to that, I live in Detroit, so I have a lot of things around Detroit that I'm starting to put into the channel. You'll see a lot more of that in the future. So between the camera gear, guitar stuff, Detroit thing, that's kind of evolved into the way that this one guitarist channel is, it's kind of is and it's kind of growing into. So now that I have my focus or my niche, they call it in YouTube, I used to call it a niche, but that's like your area of focus or your whatever you're going to focus all your content on, that's my niche. Now that I know that, I can actually plan things. So the way I plan things, I'm always coming up with ideas. I'm either writing my notebooks, I have a Trello list that I'm always putting things in, not just for this channel, but for everything in my life, my, my vacations and work and everything. So I can make lists, I can do various things with them, drag them back and forth, write notes on each thing that I put in there. So me, I have an endless amount of ideas for the channel, but I, what I do is the way I get that is I can't forget about it, so I have to put it in a list. So that's, I, that's the first thing I do is I put all my ideas in a list. Now that I have them in a list, I just need to figure out when to do them. When I first started the channel, I was doing maybe about one a week. I did the vlog thing for Christmas and I did it every day, which was really good because it helped me get pretty fast and pretty good at refining these videos. Now that 2019's out, I'm gonna be doing these two times a week. I'm gonna be doing them every Tuesday, every Thursday at 4.30. So I have my regular schedule that I'm committed to every week. And I'll probably do a Saturday thing as well too, but it's gonna be at the very least those two. Now when I shoot content, instead of doing plan, shoot, deliver, plan, shoot, deliver every single day, I'm starting to get to the point where I'm producing things a little bit more in bulk. So like when I'm doing the video series for the acoustic performance notes, I shot like six of those and like in the course of an hour or so. And then I just kind of edit them and then release them as needed. So that's what I'm gonna start doing with most of the stuff. I'm gonna kind of like shoot a lot of things in bulk and there'll be some one-off shows here and there and some vlogs that I'll just do that day and then upload it that day, which I've done I think was last Saturday. But for the most part, I'm gonna be a little more, um, a little more efficient with these. Right now I have everything planned and shot like about two weeks out. So that's, that's a pretty good cushion for me because if I get busy with something, I actually have other things that I can just, that are already uploaded and ready to go, but they're just not live yet. And I can just push them live or schedule them to a certain time when they will go live whenever I want. So that's a good cushion to be in right now. Okay, so that's the planning. Shooting, how do I shoot these things? Now, I've talked about my Fuji X-T2 quite a bit and I haven't done a review yet, but I plan to. But the majority of photos and videos that you see on this channel are done with this Fuji X-T2 camera. And I have the kit 18 to 55 lens, which as far as kits go, it's the best kit lens like ever made in my opinion. It's a fantastic camera, a great lens. There's a lot of different Fuji film simulations on this, so it's very creative. Like for instance, for Vlogmas, when I was doing the black and white thing, I shot that like that on this Fuji and I used the Acros film simulation with the yellow filter on it, which gave it a good, rich, black and white, uh, high contrast look to it. And I love that. I shoot a lot of photos in that, and a lot of videos in that as well too. The majority of times that I'm doing, that you see the color video that I take, It'll be with the, uh, I think it's called Classic Chrome. That's my favorite. It's, it can get real colorful. Fuji colors are great, but the Classic Chrome just is a little bit, uh, a little desaturated, but it's a really, really good with the contrast. It's just a really good look. The majority of color shots that you see all over on this channel are done in uh, Classic Chrome, and I really like that a lot. My microphone, I've been using, the, I did a video uh, demoing a lot of different microphones back then on the uh, channel, and the one I've been using 90% of the time is this Movo uh, XVR10. It's fantastic, it's nice, it's small, it works well. And I always have, that's my core right there, is this Fuji X-T2 with that Movo mic that's on it. That's a really, really good setup that I, I like a lot. I don't see myself changing that anytime soon. Now for formats, although this Fuji X-T2 can take 4K video, I'm just shooting uh, 1080p for here and I'm just shooting it at 30 frames per second. I've done 24, I've done 60. 60 is fine for a lot of things. Also shooting 120 frame per second so I can really do some cool slow motion. I can shoot it at 4K but it's just, it's a waste of space. Uh, it's a waste of processing time and it's completely unnecessary for YouTube. Tripods. I use this Manfrotto tripod sometimes when I need something at a lower level or if I'm holding it like this, if I'm like a selfie stick walking around with it. Now when I'm not using it that way, I have this uh, Velbon tripod that I bought like many years ago. Right now it's at its lowest height, it's on a table. The, the way that I like to shoot, it's, a, it's like my eye level but a little bit up looking at me. 
And I talk about that as far as tips. I don't like table video cameras or table-based camcorders or, or webcams or whatever coming up at you. Because I don't think, for most people, that's not a good look to be coming up at you. It doesn't. It's not very flattering to the person on video. And what's behind you ends up being like a ceiling. It's not a good shot. It's a much better shot if you can see what's behind me and even maybe a little bit up and down because it's a better shot behind me to actually frame the video more. It's just a little quality thing. It just, it just looks better. So that's my camera, that's my mic, that's my tripod. For lighting, when I'm down here, I have a regular table mic right over here on my left-hand side. I added like a little clip-on desk lamp on, on my left, your right over here, just to kind of give it a little extra fill over here because sometimes that was too dark to kind of bounce out of it. And behind me, if you notice, I always have different colors on my desk lamp over there. Those are, are my desk. Those are neon lights that are controllable. I have lots of different colors and they can flicker and do all kinds of crazy things. But I usually put them on like some kind of solid color for this. Originally I bought that for my TV upstairs to put behind the TV so it looked kind of cool. And I had it there for about a year and it was nice. Then I put them behind my bar when I had it in a certain corner upstairs and that looked really cool because everybody wouldn't hang around the bar. And then when I moved the bar, I didn't have anything to do with the lights because I moved it in the middle of the floor. So I ended up putting them here on my desk and it turned out pretty well because now when I shoot video here, I can change that to whatever color I need to, and it's kind of like a nice background color behind me. So that's how I that's how I light those up. I think those are about forty dollars, and I bought those about eight years ago, but they work pretty well. Once I'm done taking all the video, I'll have anywhere from two to thirty different uh, video files on SD cards, and I'll put them on my MacBook Pro. At first, I started editing them in iMovie, which is really really good. It's free software on a Mac, and it's uh, perfect for the majority of what you need for it. You can have a couple different visual layers, whether it's photos or video, a couple different audio layers, and you can also have different transitions, you can do basic color grading, and you can have another title layer over that. So you can do quite a bit in iMovie, a lot more than most people use it for. Um, you can do speed ramping and a lot of other things to a basic degree, but you can do a lot of cool things with it. I did switch to Final Cut Pro towards um, December because I downloaded a, a trial for it. Um, I like it a lot, I absolutely love it. I actually enjoy editing in Final Cut Pro. It's just a really great piece of software, you can do a lot of cool things with it. And I, uh, I just, like I said, it just, it's really enjoyable for me to use and I can do things very fast with it, so that's good. If I only had to get by with iMovie, it'd be perfectly fine for what most people use it for. Now once I'm done editing with those, I have to upload those. Now I can upload it directly from Final Cut Pro or iMovie to, to YouTube. I don't have to save the file and then wait for it and then upload it and then wait for it. Well, I can just upload it directly. And while it's uploading, I have a separate template text file that I'll actually open that has the majority of things I'm gonna put in the description. It'll have all, the, uh, all my Amazon affiliate links, all my links to my social media channels like Instagram, my blog, and the other parts, my .com or my .me, oneguitarist.me site that has everything on there. And then I'll have the majority of tags I'm going to copy and paste for there. Now every show I'll tweak the tags and I'll add a little bit more for the description and maybe some Ultimate Guitar tablature links, but the majority of it I can copy and paste directly from there. So I like being able to template things fast and efficiently like that. And I'll go into another show about uh, how I template my workflow in um, Final Cut Pro so I can do these things really quick and just change a few things out instead of redoing a project from start to finish. Thumbnails. A lot of people ask me how I do my thumbnails. What I'll do is I'll take the show that I'm currently looking at, I'll actually scrub the video, I'll find some kind of a really cool interesting shot, screen capture it, upload it to Canva, and I'll have a link in the description. And I have a few different, about four or five different templates in Canva, and then I'll just change the, the text as needed. Once that's, and that takes like maybe a minute. Once that's done with a new text for whatever sh show that is, I'll actually download that to my laptop and then upload that to when the, when the video is uploading to YouTube Studio for the custom thumbnail. Now on occasion, if it's sometimes you see like a bigger photo and it looks great, then when you shrink it down to thumbnail size, it kind of loses the, the image quality. You can't really tell what it is. On occasion, I will download it from here on my uh, YouTube Studio app, edit it in Snapseed a little bit and just tweak the HDR, the drama, or the contrast or the saturation a little bit so it looks a little bit better and then I'll re-upload it to the YouTube Studio thumbnail so it looks a little bit better. Uh, don't do that all the time just sometimes after it's uploaded what do I do? So now that it's uploaded I have like right now I have 216 subscribers and I subscribe to probably about 500 channels. Out of those 500 that I subscribe to I interact with a good amount of them probably about 100 of them and about 30 or 40 of them almost all the time when they're uploading things. So what I do is I try to find other channels that are kind of like mine, either guitar-ish based, or camera gear, Fuji based, or around Detroit, and I'll, content that I would like on their channel. And I'll reach out to them, I'll kind of interact with them, I'll start making 
uh, comments, nice supportive comments. Sometimes I'll just sub them and let them know I'm subbing them because I like helping out a fellow Detroiter or from one guitar player to another player. And a lot of times they'll sub you back as well too. Now I'm not doing the sub for subs thing because that's an empty thing and people go into that why it's a bad idea. When you just trade subscriptions and you don't watch each other's channel, it does nothing except you have all these subscribers and nobody watches your stuff. What I'm doing is kind of like a more of a mutual support thing. And on a regular basis, I, when you start doing these, people will start interacting with you more and they'll start commenting on your channel more and, and you can kind of like help each other grow because you, you generally have an interest in each other. Now, if just like any friendship and all that, if you are doing that constantly to one channel and they're not doing it back, then what do you do? You kind of cut back on doing that and you don't do it as much. But after you do that for a while, you'll figure out your core group of people. Like I said, out of my 216 subscribers and 600, 500 people that I subscribe to, there's about a good... 40, 50 of us that are always like interacting with each other's channel all the time. And I've got a great group of friends that I've made on uh, YouTube that are really, really cool for that. I'm always looking forward to their stuff and I comment on them and they're the same with me too. I don't even have to promote things as much anymore because as soon as I just release something, there's a group that's that's uh, that's helping that's helping and supportive and I do the same with theirs as well too. And I think you'll find out that the more you reach out and the more you think of YouTube as a community, and kind of like friendships that you're building, at least at first. You know, if you get to the point where you have 10,000 subscribers, you can't you can't be interactive with everybody else's channel all the time. But at first, when you're growing, there's going to be a core group of you. At least I feel that's what it seems like to me so far. After two months and 215 subscribers that are actively growing, you'll start interacting with more channels, and they'll start interacting with you, and you'll have your core group of what they call them, like your tribe, your YouTube tribe, your your core group of people that you'll always support each other. And I think it's good to grow that. And like I said, I think it's more of a community. And I'll be the first one to tell you, like about six months ago, I didn't consider YouTube anything more than a repository of random videos. You just search for what you wanted to and then you leave. I would use YouTube for song lists because there's a lot of songs on YouTube and I would just have like a song playlist. But other than that, I would go on YouTube, I'd like find a video or somebody would send me a funny link and I'd look at it and I'd leave. I didn't consider it a social community at all, but it really is. And at first I didn't, uh, I thought that the idea of the channels was silly. I'm like, these aren't channels. Gee, this is stupid. It's not a channel thing. It's just random stuff. But you know what? It really is a channel. These are channels. Because you have to look at it that way and you have to treat it like that. Like, why is somebody going to come to your channel? As opposed to, first of all, how are they going to find it in the first place? The way you'd search for different uh, thumbnails on Netflix or something. You're scrolling through a bunch of things. Oh, this one looks interesting. So first of all, you have to grab their attention. You have to have a nice looking thumbnail and a good some some kind of branding. They have to, there's some, some reason why when somebody watches the end of a video, and they see a grid of all the thumbnails, why are they gonna click on yours? Does it have a really good catchy title? Does it look great? Does it look crazy? Does it, is it interesting? What's gonna make them click on yours? So you have to think about the branding and the advertising. That first impression is huge. And I can do another show like that in the future that talks about the uh, more of the detail on how you grow a channel and how you interact with other channels and how you do branding and more marketing. And you just uh, you know grow it into its own, its own identity so far if you want. And if you don't want to, that's fine. There are a lot of different things you can do on YouTube and you don't have to grow like your own channel. Sometimes you just want a few different people or sometimes you just want a, a place to put your family videos, which is fine too. And you don't always have to have them public. You can have them private. If it's private, it's just your account. You have to be signed into your account and you're the only ones who can see it. You can have them unlisted, meaning that it's not really public, but you can send the link out to anybody they can see it. Unlisted thing's kind of cool. That's kind of, some people do that and just send out videos when they need to here and there. I've used that before, before I started this channel to have a couple tests that I would send out to just a few people so it wouldn't show, but I could send links to people out to get feedback. Like, hey, how does this look? How does this camera angle look? And I'll send out these video tests and I would get feedback from them. I, so I used it for that. And then there's also the public thing where as soon as you have it, it's it, the, the public can, can find it. Now, if you're a small YouTuber, it's gonna be hard for you to be found in 80 billion or whatever people, but, uh, but if you want to be found and if you want to grow your channel and reach out there are a lot of different ways you can do that, some of which I described on this show right here today, and some of which I'll get into more in later uh, episodes as well. So so anyways, to wrap it up, if you liked the video, um, let me know. Let me know in a comment below. Also, let me know if I should do more videos like this in the future. I've been getting asked to do a lot of them, so um, I figured I'd do this one, and I'll probably get into more detail. But let me know what you think. If you think I should, if you would like to see more of this on the channel, or, or if there's anything else you think I should cover on the channel that's Detroit-ish, or camera video gear-ish, or um, guitar bass ish. Anyways, thanks for tuning in. I really appreciate it and I'll see you in the next video.